Today, we're going to take a look at two of the most commonly used forecasts in aviation. We're going to talk about their advantages and disadvantages. And then we're going to talk about a third that you really should be using. But honestly, most pilots aren't. So the two most used forecasts in aviation are the graphical forecast for aviation or the GFA, and then the ubiquitous TAF. When we say forecast, I think most pilots go straight to a TAF. The forecast that a lot of pilots don't use is the area forecast discussion. And it's a great tool to fill in the blanks in between terminal forecasts. The challenge is it's number one, text-based, and number two, it's got a lot of meteorological terms. But once you understand the fundamentals, it's really easy to use. We'll start with the GFA or the graphical forecast for aviation. And there are a few different places that you're gonna find this forecast use. So number one, you can find it on aviationweather.gov slash GFA. And that gives you an entire interactive map with an 18 hour forecast window. You'll also find the imagery used in your EFB's standard briefings like ForeFlight or Garmin Pilot. When I'm researching my route of flight and trying to get an overall picture of the weather, I really like to use the website at Aviation Weather simply because the map makes it much easier for me to see what's going on and to switch between layers. Then I'll also get the imagery along with my standard weather briefing, which I can pack and save for my flight so I have access to it in the air. So it's got a few different layers. We have ceiling and visibility, clouds, precip, thunderstorms, temperature, winds, turbulence, and icing. And a few of these layers are gonna give you information that you would not be able to find in the terminal forecast. You won't find temperature, cloud layers, or turbulence or icing anywhere in the TAF. That's something that you can get out of the GFA. The challenge with the GFA is that it is entirely model driven without forecaster input. And so that means that there's no way to correct the model when it misses some sort of a local influence. And of course, any model, no matter how good it is, is never going to be perfect. So this gives us a good broad view of the weather, broad view of fronts and pressure systems, a broad view of where precipitation is now and where it's going to move over the next 18 hours and large areas that are gonna be affected. When it comes to things like convection, I'm using this forecast to give me an idea of what areas the United States are gonna give me the best option to complete my flight. Because oftentimes when you're on a long trip, in a light aircraft, a direct flight to your destination just is not the best way to go. And even though a dogleg may take you a couple hundred miles out of the way, reality is if it keeps you in much better weather, it's gonna make the flight much easier to complete. And that is something that you can easily see on the graphical forecast for aviation. This forecast also provides us the primary forecast for airports that are not served by a TAF. Okay, so the next forecast we're gonna look at is the terminal area forecast or the TAF. And I would say this is by far the most used location forecast in aviation. Almost, I think, sometimes overused because people will use it to forecast weather at airports close to, but not the TAF airport. So TAFs are generally considered to be significantly more accurate than the GFA. And that's fairly true for one big reason. They have local forecaster input. So a terminal forecast is actually written by the NWS forecast office for the area. That forecaster is using different models, different model data, and their local experience to come up with the forecast itself. But as I said, it covers a fairly small area. The precipitation and weather in the forecast is expected to occur within five miles of the airport, unless it's described as in the vicinity. If it's in the vicinity, that expands up to 10 miles. So when you think about this, if they say there's gonna be showers in the vicinity, does that mean that that forecaster forecasted this one specific shower cell that was gonna go by the airport, but not close enough to be over the airport, it was gonna go maybe six and a half miles off to the side. So it's in the vicinity, not at all. They're not that accurate. Instead, what they're doing is looking at the probability of weather coverage. And when the forecaster says something is going to occur in the vicinity, Essentially what they're saying is, there's not gonna be enough coverage of this weather to put it necessarily over the airport, but you're gonna find it in the general area. Again, the challenge with a TAF is that general area 
only goes out to 10 miles. And I would say one of the challenges that we have with pilots is filling in those airports that are not served by a TAF. A big common error is to find an airport maybe 30 or 40 miles away that has a TAF and to use that forecast. And the challenge is weather can change massively over 20 or 30 miles, especially when you're dealing with terrain. So I wouldn't use one airport's TAF to forecast the specific weather at another airport. I'll look at TAFs in an area and use that to get an idea of the overall weather picture. And then I'll combine that with the graphical forecast for aviation. But again, a TAF really isn't completely transferable. You can't take Rocky Mountain Metro's TAF and apply that to Denver Centennial or Longmont or Fort Collins Loveland. So the area forecast discussion is authored by the NWS forecaster who creates the TAFs for a TAF cycle. Unlike a TAF, it isn't issued at specific times of the day on a set update schedule. Instead, it's kind of issued as needed generally when those TAFs are updated. And then if conditions change throughout the day, the forecaster will update the area forecast discussion. The challenge with the area forecast discussion is number one, it's entirely textual. It's basically written as paragraphs, not as coded lines of a forecast, but you can't see it graphically. The other challenge with the area forecast discussion is that you're going to find a lot of meteorological terms that honestly, as you start to read them, you will begin to understand. But initially, at that kind of first glance, it can be a little bit overwhelming. I think one of the best rules of mountain flying is that when you go into an area that you're not familiar with, find some local knowledge. Any experienced mountain pilot will tell you that local knowledge is the best knowledge. And that's true when it comes to forecasting as well, because a local forecaster knows what models tend to work best under what conditions. And weather is complex. It can't be perfectly predicted by a computer. In fact, if you're looking for specific location weather, oftentimes the computer isn't going to get you that close, but it's good at a broad scale. On the other hand, that weather forecaster who knows that region can do a great job of interpreting those different models and the synoptic weather and then putting together a good forecast. So that's the best part about this. It gets you inside the forecaster's mind. They could tell you why they're writing the forecast the way they did and what parts of that forecast maybe they're not super confident in. There might be items that they left out of the forecast like thunderstorms because the probability was fairly low, but they'll bring them up in the area forecast discussion and describe the conditions in which they might occur. They'll also talk about those inhibitors. Remember, we talked about cirrus shields. We talked about caps in a previous video. You'll find those discussed in the area forecast discussion. So again, it's not really just a statement of this weather at this time. Instead, it's more a short discussion of what that forecaster was thinking and how things might progress when conditions change. So area forecast discussions were organized into different sections. And depending on the forecast office and the day, those sections can change a little bit. But typically you're gonna find some key messages. You might find a meteorological synopsis. Then you're gonna have either a near-term or a near and short-term discussion, a long-term discussion that's gonna carry you out several days, an aviation discussion, which focuses on the TAF sites and other airports in between, and then you may have a hydrology section that talks about flooding, a fire section, a marine section, all depending on where you live and the kind of weather that's occurring. You can find these in pretty much every electronic flight bag. In ForeFlight, it's under the forecast discussion link by the TAF. In a Garmin Pilot, it's under the discussion tab. And as you become more experienced with reading forecasts and interpreting convective weather, you're going to start to get into more meteorological terms and more meteorological principles, like CAPE values and convective inhibition. And oftentimes we get asked, what's a good value of CAPE to create a thunderstorm? Or how low can the CAPE get before convection no longer starts? And the answer is, it really depends. But the advantage to the area forecast discussion is that they're going to talk about that. They'll mention the CAPE values. But if you don't understand them, don't worry about it because they're going to explain what those mean. So they'll explain whether a CAPE value is going to be strong enough in their opinion to trigger storms and what might be able to change that value either to kill off the storms or to cause them to become more severe. And the other side of this is this was issued by the National Weather Forecast Office. And that means that 
If there's something in the discussion that you don't understand, but you want more information on, you can call the forecast office. So that's why I think this forecast is so important because it really gets you into the forecaster's mind and that helps you make stronger decisions because looking at a TAF can give you a lot of information. But again, it's distilled down into pretty concise weather statements. And the graphical forecast for aviation is another great product, but it's a big picture forecast that's entirely model driven. And again, will miss localized weather influences. And the last thing here is that we need to use our common sense as pilots. A lot of people will tell you the very best forecast is your eyes. And that's not only true on the ground, it's also true in the air. When you see something like upslope flow convergence, regardless of whether there are showers or storms forecast in the area forecast discussion or in a TAF or in the GFA, if I see something like this, I know there's moisture, I know there's lifting action, I expect at least I'm gonna face some large cumulus clouds. And again, the challenge for us as pilots is that we don't necessarily need a severe storm to block our path. Just a good shower with rain, especially over high country like Colorado, is gonna generate enough turbulence and enough icing to make it impossible to fly through that area. But when you understand what drives weather, when you understand how terrain influences weather, not only can you make better decisions about routes that you're gonna take, but then as you're flying, you have a better understanding of what's going on around you. As you see things, you're gonna understand what's happening from a weather perspective. And that's gonna give you the ability to make smarter diversion decisions, not only so you're safe, I think that's just kind of a baseline, but ultimately it's gonna get you closer to, or hopefully all the way to your destination. And those are the things that we covered in our mountain weather course. It's not really a course for mountain meteorologists, it's a course for pilots who fly somewhere around terrain, whether it's the Colorado Rockies, the Appalachian, Sierra Nevada, the Cascades. And again, not necessarily in a Husky flying into a backcountry strip. I've never done that myself, but instead just flying somewhere in the vicinity. We fly over the mountains, we fly into improved airports in the mountains, but honestly, the most mountain weather that Colin and I feel when we're flying is when we're flying out of Rocky Mountain Metro and Denver Centennial. People don't think of those as mountain airports, but they absolutely are because their weather is driven by the mountains. And that course, as well as all of our other courses, is on sale 20% off until Thursday. And again, the most common question we get for all of our courses is how long do I have access? It's a one-time purchase and you have lifetime access. And there's a reason for that. I still go back to the same books that I used when I was at UND in the 90s, learning to fly. Aerodynamics for Naval Aviators is still the same edition that it was when I read it back at UND. And it's still my go-to reference for aerodynamics. The reality is I can't read something once and remember it for life. And so I'm constantly going back through courses and information to keep myself current. And so that's how we build our courses. That's how we build Mastering Takeoffs and Landings, Mountain Weather, Airspace, all of our courses. So at any point in time, you can go back into the course and review something. Now, a lot of you guys have been taking the challenges and we're gonna to start to add those to our courses as well. So if you're in any of our courses, look for that. We're gonna to start to bring in some shorts, current scenarios, and then challenges so that you can apply what you've learned to actual flying weather throughout all the seasons. Okay, so some of you I'm sure have quite a bit of experience with these different forecasts and you formed your own opinions about their accuracy from the GFA which I think can be a little bit controversial with some pilots all the way through to that area forecast discussion. Let me know what you think about them, which ones you find the most useful in the comments down below.